The Book of Mormon, an account written by the hand of Mormon upon plates, taken from the plates of Nephi. Wherefore, it is an abridgment of the record of the people of Nephi, and also of the Lamanites, written to the Lamanites, who are a remnant of the house of Israel, and also to Jew and Gentile, written by way of commandment, and also by the spirit of prophecy and of revelation, written and sealed up and hid up unto the Lord that they might not be destroyed to come forth by the gift and power of God unto the interpretation thereof sealed by the hand of Moroni and hid up unto the Lord to come forth in due time by way of the Gentile the interpretation thereof by the gift of God and also to the convincing of the Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ the eternal God, manifesting himself unto all nations. And now, if there are faults, they are the mistakes of men. Wherefore, condemn not the things of God, that ye may be found spotless at the judgment seat of Christ. At the end of his lonely thirty-six year sojourn, Moroni carried the book to a hill in what we now call western New York State, and buried it there where it lay, undisturbed, for one thousand four hundred years. Sometime between the year 421 A.D. when he buried the record, and the autumn of 1823, Moroni was resurrected from the dead, and commissioned by God with an urgent mission. He was to return to earth as an angel, among mortal men for a time, to see that the record he had buried would be discovered, translated into modern languages, and published to the world by a faithful and righteous man who would use the information therein to serve modern mankind as a prophet. By the year 1823, after the American Constitution had established the first stable society with religious freedom, English-speaking people living in western New York were rapidly clearing the forests, cultivating the land, discovering artifacts and ruins from the mound-builder Indians, and mining the hills for precious metals. Moroni knew of a righteous, spiritually sensitive young man living in the area who had already been called by God to prepare for an important mission. His name was Joseph Smith and on the evening of September 21st, 1823, as Joseph was praying for further guidance, Moroni went to him and told him where he should go to find the ancient record a few miles from his home. Within twenty-four hours, Moroni met with Joseph at the site of an ancient stone box whose upper surfaces were already exposed to the elements near the top of a nearby hill that was still partly forested Within that box, Joseph saw several items of obvious antiquity and great value, including a large stack of rectangular gold sheets or plates, completely covered with ancient writing, bound together along one edge with wire hinges. Moroni warned Joseph that the gold was not to be retained, and would never be used to bring wealth to him or to his family and alerted him against the dangers of monetary greed. He instructed Joseph to rebury the contents and the stone box to prevent immediate discovery by others, and to return to meet with him at that place annually for further instructions. During the next four years, while the location of the reburied plates was preserved as a carefully guarded secret, Moroni visited with Joseph frequently. Although Joseph was permitted to tell others of the visits and of the many things he learned in his interviews, the visits themselves were always held in secret. Joseph had been chosen to translate the text of the precious records into English, and he had to be taught how to do so. The process, he learned, would require the plates themselves, diligent study, and ancient instruments known as Urim and Thummim that had been prepared by God for the purpose, and that Moroni had buried with the record. The process would also require faith, spiritual sensitivity, and repentance. 
Joseph's willingness to share this information attracted a lot of attention, most of it hostile. Numerous newspaper articles were written about Joseph's family at this time, and he was singled out for ridicule as his claims became generally known in the adjacent communities. By late 1827, Moroni concluded that the plates would be safer in Joseph's possession than in their hiding place on the hillside, and Joseph took them home to hide them on his father's farm on the 22nd of September. Joseph was commanded not to show them to anyone until specifically instructed to do so. For the next two years, Joseph and his new wife, Emma, had to move several times to escape thieves and opportunists who sought every occasion to get them. Due to this opposition, the general poverty of his existence and setbacks from thieves that stole, manipulated, and eventually destroyed 116 pages of his translation work, progress was slow, and he had only 16 translated pages in his possession by the beginning of April 1829. Then he was joined by Oliver Cowdery, a righteous schoolteacher that had learned of Joseph's sacred work. The pair was unstoppable. Working behind a curtain in half of the attic of a frontier farmhouse so that others could not see the plates, Joseph translated their contents phrase by phrase into English, verbalizing each phrase so that Oliver could write it down. Hour after hour, Day after day, for seventy-five days, almost non-stop, Oliver recorded the text as it fell from the lips of Joseph Smith, and he could tell that the work was beyond the mortal capacities of any man. After stopping for meals, sleep, or rest, Joseph would immediately resume exactly where he had left off, without ever asking to have prior text read back to him passers-by, the people living in the farmhouse, and family members could hear what was being said, and the knowledge of the activity was widespread. Newspapers gushed with scintillating accounts of the Golden Bible. Some of these accounts were positive, but most were skeptical or cynical. Even though Joseph had cautioned his family that, that they would not be able to keep or benefit financially from the Golden Treasure, all of Joseph's family members were convinced that the work was of God, as was Oliver, and all of the people living in the farmhouse who had heard the work of the translation in process. Hostile newspaper articles from this period, visible in museums and collections to this day, describe the work in terms like, Everybody knows that Joe Smith is writing his golden Bible again. Joe is uneducated and can hardly stitch two sentences together. His skill is so bad that he couldn't even write a legible hand, so he needs Oliver Cowdery to pen his mumblings. His book will never amount to anything because it can't contain anything sensible. Time will show that this is all a big waste of resources and will come to nothing. This was the first of three contradictory theories concocted by opponents in their attempt to discredit the Book of Mormon, but it had to be abandoned within a year, as thousands of enthusiastic well-educated converts accepted the book as divine. At the conclusion of this amazing 75-day period, a carefully guarded, carefully organized stack of hundreds of handwritten manuscript pages was in the possession of Oliver Cowdery and the Smith family. A printer was hired to publish 5,000 copies of the resulting 500-page volume, at the formidable price of three thousand United States dollars. A wealthy, influential, and respected local farmer named Martin Harris, whose family had been involved in the theft of some of the early manuscript pages, had become a believer, and agreed to mortgage his farm and to put at risk all of his possessions, if necessary, to pay the bill. In order to fulfill his divine angelic mission, the resurrected Moroni needed to commission mortal witnesses besides Joseph Smith, and he needed to make sure that those witnesses had absolute, unquestioned knowledge 
of the divinity and importance of the work so that they could testify powerfully about it for the remainder of their lives. He commanded Joseph, Oliver Cowdery, Martin Harris, and David Whitmer, one of those living in the farmhouse who had heard much of the translation activity, to go into a nearby forest and pray, promising that if they were faithful, he, Moroni, would personally bring the plates to the group and allow their inspection. However, Martin Harris was unable to fully rid himself of guilt from his family's early theft, and Moroni refused to show himself until Martin gave up and departed. Shortly thereafter, Moroni did bring the plates, personally showing them to Oliver Cowdery and David Whitmer in company with Joseph Smith. Later that day, after Martin Harris had fully repented, Moroni came again and showed the same things to him, again in the presence of Joseph Smith. Moroni's mission was almost complete. In addition to Joseph Smith, three respected men had seen him and the original text of Mormon's book engraved in pure, durable, hard to imitate, gold. But before permanent removal of the plates from Joseph's care, to fulfill his mission with even greater certainty in the eyes of the incredulous public, Moroni told Joseph Smith to carry the plates to an outdoor meeting where he must also show them to eight other men who would be required to join him and the three aforementioned witnesses in testimony for the remainder of their lives. Accordingly, Joseph personally showed the entire heavy collection of golden plates to eight other men, all together in a singular amazing occasion in the broad June daylight, allowing each to handle the individual leaves and answering their detailed questions until they were all completely satisfied. Here is their written testimony, which has been published, along with a very similar statement by the original three witnesses, in every edition of the Book of Mormon thereafter. The Testimony of Eight Witnesses Be it known unto all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people unto whom this work shall come, that Joseph Smith, Jr., the translator of this work, has shown unto us the plates of which hath been spoken, which have the appearance of gold. And as many of the leaves as the said Smith has translated, we did handle with our hands, and we also saw the engravings thereon, all of which has the appearance of ancient work and of curious workmanship. And this we bear record with words of soberness, that the said Smith has shown unto us, for we have seen and hefted and know of a surety that the said smith has got the plates of which we have spoken. And we give our names unto the world, to witness unto the world that which we have seen. And we lie not, God bearing witness of it. Christian Whitmer, Jacob Whitmer, Peter Whitmer, Jr., John Whitmer, Hiram Page, Joseph Smith, Sr., Hiram Smith, Samuel H. Smith. Thus, on three separate occasions, twelve different men from five distinct families, from all walks of life, some wealthy, some poor, some educated, some barely literate, some who had known Joseph Smith all his days and others that had only recently heard of him, saw, felt, hefted, and examined the details of the golden plates containing the original manuscript of the Book of Mormon and publicly testified to that fact. Their testimonies were written, signed, printed, published, distributed, and subjected to public scrutiny in a manner that would prove their point as valid evidence beyond any doubt in any contemporary court of law making the fact of the Book of Mormon's divine origin the single best-attested miracle in the history of the world. To further underscore the reality of what they had seen, heard, hefted, felt, and examined in detail, all twelve of these men repeated their testimonies many times throughout their lives. 
Many of these repeated testimonies were written down and published in the newspapers of their times, where they can still be examined to this day. Thousands of others were recorded in personal diaries of people who heard them. Although these men were all hated and persecuted for their statements and zeal, all of them went to their graves affirming the truth of these amazing events. They all said, over and over again, that there had been no deception. The first of these twelve men to die was Joseph Smith, Sr., the father of the prophet. He had remained faithful to his testimony into his old age, and was serving as the patriarch to the church at the time of his death. Joseph and Hiram Smith both died on the same day, under the guns of a paramilitary mob that stormed the jail where they had been held prisoner by their enemies. They had two days to negotiate for their lives, and had they chosen to deny their reports of the things I have told you, their lives would undoubtedly have been spared. But they chose death before denial. Samuel Smith died in the full faith and fellowship of the church a few days later, in the turmoil that followed as he strove to prevent civil war. Although all twelve of the witnesses joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, several of them had disagreements with Joseph Smith and left the church. Some, like Oliver Cowdery and Martin Harris, eventually came back. Others, like David Whitmer, and most of his family never did. Enemies of the church are quick to point this out. They want you to leap to the conclusion that they denied their testimonies, or at least stopped testifying after they left the church. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Most of their long-lasting disagreements flared over the handling of the war, declared against the Mormons by the governor and state militia of Missouri. These disagreements separated them from the church, and their pride prevented their return, but they remembered their responsibility to testify, so they did the only thing they could do. They formed their own tiny church, based on both the Bible and the Book of Mormon. Their descendants still manage museums and collections that proudly display important relics from this period proving the faith with which they continued to testify. None of them ever claimed that he was deceived when he saw Moroni or the Golden Plates, and all took extraordinary steps to counter any claims to the contrary.